Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Latest Shiny podcast. With me is uh, Rob Hirschfeld, as usual. Rob, uh, good morning. Hello, everyone. Hey, Steve. Hi. And uh, today, again, we always have great guests for you. And uh, we have the principal analyst from uh, Tyrius uh, Research, uh, Paul Teich. And uh, Paul, uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. So, Paul, before we go, we'd like to just have you give us a quick overview of your background and everything so people... Uh, you know, understand uh, where you come from and your knowledge space. Okay, sounds great. Um, I'm principal analyst, uh, one of three with uh, Terius Research. Uh, been doing the analyst gig for about five years now. Uh, prior to that, I spent cumulatively 20 years at AMD. Uh, spent the ni 90s uh, in the consumer market, consumer PCs. Spent the aughts launching the Opteron product line 2002 through uh, 2012 with AMD, my second tour of duty, and ended up in corporate strategy. So went from the marketing and, and market intelligence competitive analysis uh, team to, uh, to launching, launching the uh, Opteron product line in, into the data center market. And then, then went on to you know, bring AMD into the ARM world uh, as short-lived as that was. And we bought C-Micro, worked with data center fabrics, things like that. In between, during the irrational exuberance, I helped launch a web service that was uncannily like Evernote, but seven years too early to market. So I've stood up a web service back at the turn of the millennium and ran through about $7 million in venture capital doing that before we folded shop. Prior to all that, I spent a decade as a software engineer, C on, uh, on various flavors of Unix. And, and I, I have my, my bachelor's degree is computer science with electrical engineering. So thanks, Paul. That is the complete, we've never had anyone tell us what their degrees are, Rob. So. <laughs> well, I have another one. I, I, I went to uh, University of Texas Macomb School for a, and kind of not an MBA. I explicitly didn't want to do that. So I, I have an MS in uh, technology commercialization. All right. And the undergrad was at Texas. We have to know our schools because football. <laughs> so. No, I have a bicameral mind. So my undergrad was at Texas A&M and my graduate was at University of Texas. Well, that's not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not allowed to be said aloud. <laughs> One of the, the funny things with Paul is that he and I are both in Austin, but we, we have a tendency to meet on the airplanes leaving <laughs> or, or in other locations. Uh, exactly. Which, which is sort of fun, um, which is sort of a classic trope for Austin people to meet only, on, only at the airport. Um, so the thing I love about talking to Paul is that we, we get into these really interesting conversations about broad IT topics and then you pull it back into something I love dearly, which is the hardware components and how the chips and how the manufacturing decisions and the packaging actually really impact what the market's going to be. And, and from that perspective, it ends up being, you know, a really informative discussion because it, hardware choice still matters, right? Chips matter, uh, capabilities matter, you know, even FPGAs and things like that. And, and these are things that you, you know, this is this is your bread and butter, um, and with that, I I'm, I want to start us on something that is today topical. Will be hopefully a, a more of a distant memory by the time the listeners hear this, um, which is the Spectre and the Meltdown um, chipset bugs. I, I don't want to decompose that, but I'm interested in you know your sort of your take is are these the bugs that finally get us to pay attention to security? That's a great question. And I, th I think in a nutshell, first order impact is these are the bugs that get us to update regularly. So I, I think what we're gonna see is a large unplanned uh, update across Linux, Unix, Windows, folks writing containers. It, the, the upshot here is that these bugs affect pretty much every architecture out there to, to one degree or another. So first, you know, we, we may, it may be bits versus atoms and bits win, but you have to run bits on atoms. And, and so the, the impact here is that 
anybody running a physical processor, which is all of us, uh, are gonna have to pay attention to these updates. And the important part is that, although they, the industry managed to work together, which, which was great to see, by the way, uh, Google spearheading having dire enemies working together in total silence on this to get fixes implemented um, before they announced the bug or the series of bugs and, and the possible exploits and, oh, here's, here's code you can use today to go mitigate the damage while we figure out actually how, how to re-engineer our chips to make this not happen. Uh, so the first order is that we're gonna see a lot of enterprise IT shops evaluate the fixes. So this isn't, a, this isn't gonna happen overnight. Uh, we're, we're gonna be dealing with this for months as every IT shop you know, brings the updates and patches in, you know, validates the patches against their infrastructure. Some of them are gonna have to upgrade whatever, you know, Windows server or Linux variant that they're using in order to implement the patches. Cause the patches, right. you know, although the patches are going to address chips that are you know, in many cases, five to 10 years old, I, I don't believe they're going to regressively test, you know, all the old versions of Linux for the past five to 10 years, just not going to happen. So, so is part of, is part of the answer here, just an industry wide refresh? I mean, new hardware, new, I mean, new operating systems, you're going to basically be churning a whole, you know, all the old stuff is, is basically, you know, not more vulnerable, but hard, that much harder to patch and fix. Right. So two waves. Um, okay. The first, first wave is the software updates. And, and because we don't have hardware yet, assuming that everybody started to redesign their speculative execution out of order pipelines six months ago, we're at least 12 months off from seeing new silicon in the market that, that addresses wow. these bugs in hardware where it should be addressed. Okay. So the, the near term rush is the scramble is going to be updating software infrastructure. So hypervisors, uh, host operating systems, guest operating systems, everybody's got to go figure out where they need to move to to implement the patches uh, because customers are going to demand that for security, yeah. right? Um, so this is going to impact enterprise. It's going to impact cloud, um, managed hosting environments. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's really, there's no immunity here, which is the depth of seriousness in, in these expo potential exploits. Um, then what we'll see, and, and going into 2018, leaving, leaving 2017, my, my impression of 2018 is we were in this great, perfect storm of new architectures. We've got Qualcomm-centric Cavium Thunder X2, IBM's Power9 just launched a little bit softly, but it's it, the refresh is out there. Um, we, we have all this new architecture coming out in addition to, to Intel Skylake generation hitting the market. And what this will do in 12 to 18 months it, as these vendors refresh their product lines to address Spectre and Meltdown, um, the choice isn't just going to be about a x86. Forgot to mention AMD and Epic, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is a perfect storm. There's a lot of architectural choices out there. And I think what this, the net effect of this um, will be positive for everyone except Intel uh, because the installed base will churn more than right. I think we've ever seen it churn. So okay. this is an opportunity for people with a 12 month window, which is unusual to yeah. say, Oh, maybe I should be looking at arm. Maybe I should be looking at AMD. Maybe I should be looking at, you know, more variation in the architectures for the, the hardware that I've, I've considered because right. I'm, I'm basically going to be replacing massive amounts of my fleet. Um, and suddenly the cost of doing that's going to be a, a, a big factor of cost and power manageability are all going to be, you know, things that companies evaluate. Absolutely. It, it is going to be, um, I think certainly in the last couple of decades, this is going to be a refresh cycle like like none we've seen in the data center market. Uh, so, because it's such a security, there's there so many implications to not doing it. E even if there aren't any really good exploits developed 
for these potential holes. We're, we're going to see people update just because it's such an issue. Um, right. It's a checkbox, right? right. So, so, so there's two takeaways for this. One is if you are you know, running infrastructure, looking at infrastructure, you, you, we've now sort of created a reason for you to look at new, new infrastructures um, at a much, much more aggressively than you had in the past because you're not just buying the next model x86 chip necessarily you actually have an opportunity you have to replace everything so the opportunity to, to flex into something new is high yep um but we're taught we're talking about this sort of as a oh here's one thing you fix it and and go about your merry way and and you and i both know that that that's not the pattern right these exploits are happening faster right their issues are issues are more frequent um everybody you know sort of slept through this uh hardware um signing module HSM issue where keys weren't being generated securely and requiring a patch and regeneration of keys um, last month. Um, how does that, you know, what, what do companies think about in that regard, right? Not, this isn't a one-time event. What, what do you recommend? Actually, it's funny because at the end of the day, it seems trite to say companies are in business to make money. It's not about shareholder value. Satisfying customers is great to say, but at, at the end of the day, a company has to generate a profit to stay mm -hmm. in business. And so companies will only move when their customer base demands it. There's a competitive uh, impetus to the system, uh, impulse power. Either you have competitors who are continually driving your progress, like the AMD Intel CPU wars in the, in the aughts, right? We right. Drove the industry because it was a continual one-upsmanship. And consumers benefited because each of the vendors was trying to outdo the other in better serving the, the customers. Uh, if you don't have that kind of pressure, competitive pressure, and security is one of those areas where unless you have a major flaw that your customers really understand, not just one or two of them, but all of your customers, there's, there's no incentive to, to really move fast or move hard. Right. Okay. So Spectre Meltdown provide this, to me, it's, a, it's kind of a one-time hit to build your customer goodwill and awareness that you're on top of security, you're on top of updates, you're gonna get your customers through this or they're gonna go somewhere else, right? And so I think it's, it's not going to force a huge awareness of deep security issues. It is going to force an awareness of, all right, so I need to keep my software infrastructure current. Ah, right. Okay. I need to make sure I'm not falling behind on my patches. And I think that's where security will benefit, but it probably won't drive. So that's, I mean, we've been watching this happen from a, an agility perspective, because generally if you can manage and patch and keep up with, with your software changes, it's, it's a business advantage, regardless of security. Yes. Um, and, and, and go ahead. Yeah. You know, some if you're, if you're a hoster, regional hoster, say mid-sized regional hoster, and you have a, you have a bunch of companies that you've been serving well over the years, uh, and there's not much incentive to change, but slowly with the technology base and bringing your customers along uh, you know, from outright you know, rack and stack hosting to managed services, I think this, this falls into the all of a sudden your customers are going to be concerned about something you may not have been doing. Hmm, okay. okay. You may not be current on your patches. You may have used an older version of Linux because you're familiar with it, because you're deploying it at scale. It's stable. You've really had no good reason to move off of 14.4 or something like that. Right. Um, <laughs> right. So, That's right. Yeah. You know, but now, now everybody is going to be watching. And, and, and it's not even 14.4. It's, oh, shoot, I, I might stay on 14.4, but now I have to reset, you know, a you know, every machine in my fleet to 14.4 dot, you know, patched. Exactly. Yes. And, yeah. and by the way, you have a week to accomplish that feat. And that's not USBs and, 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 you know, crash carts. That's, you know, 
that needs to be something that you are planning to do on a monthly or faster cadence because right. that's what we're looking at from a security posture. So last night, um, apparently Intel patched some of its infrastructure. They had portions of their site offline um, for a while. And, and we'll see that with major services. The cloud services are going to have rolling blackouts probably. Um, it depends on how much infrastructure they have deployed. Uh, the larger folks like Microsoft, AWS, probably less impacted, uh, but they're still gonna have to roll out the patches quickly across a huge amount of infrastructure. If you're running your, if you're, not many people do, but if you're hosting your own website, uh, you've got to take it down for the patches. And I, I think that's probably what we saw was, uh, was Intel taking portions of its site offline to um, upgrade them uh, last night. And that's just me speculating, but um, it, it's hard to see them not being available for other reasons now. Uh, okay. I, and some of, some of this, I guess I'm, I'm, jump, I'm, I'm biting my tongue a little bit because this is right. Part of what rack ends mission and, and mantra is for our customers. Um, right. and what we're, what we're trying to see is, is that, you know, if you're not thinking through how you automate these deployments at scale so that you can, you know, quickly up and re up the infrastructure, um, then you're, you're going to be in serious trouble. Uh, you know, we've talked about it generally from business agility perspective because of the amount of change coming down the pipe for people. But security is, is a factor with this too. And, and I th you know, you, you said this really well. It's not a, oh, I, I, you know, oh, sorry, Windows, you suckers. You know, all the, all the Linux people are sitting pretty. It, this is, you know, security vulnerabilities that come at you from every direction today. Yes. Um, it, I think the important part here that a lot of folks may be missing is this is a serious ex potential exploit that affects all the chips, all the operating systems, but it won't be the last. Okay. So planning today for how you're going to address specter meltdown uh, will give some indication as to how you're going to react in the future because there will be other bugs. Okay, they're, they're, it's just almost guaranteed. It may be operating system specific, but we're not done with major bugs. This is like in central Texas, getting rain from a hurricane to fill our lakes and all of a sudden <laughs> we're, we're good, but we haven't had any more rain. Right. <laughs> so. it's, this, is, this is something we, we have to be prepared about. So, so that, that, you know, one of, one of the segues to me for this to Edge, which is one of our favorite topics, is, you know, Edge is going to, you know, it's going to be highly distributed management infrastructure where you, you don't have thousands of machines to fix in tens of data centers. You have tens of machines to fix in thousands of data centers. Um, so it's a, it's a different process concern and you have even less control in those infrastructures. What we just described, if I was, if I had tens of thousands of data centers would terrify me. Um, <laughs> And, and, all, and all of that, it really depends on how you define edge. Okay. So if you define edge as not being you know, in a dedicated data center space, so say edge is in, in a, you know, a cell phone, a, a cell, cellular cell base yeah. station, right? Um, edge is in a factory doing robotics automation. Edge is maybe uh, the set-top box, a Roku or Fire TV or, or whatever you've got in your house as a media server. Uh, so there, there are lots of different definitions of edge. So, so yeah. go ahead. I, I mean, we, one of our, 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 I guess, rites of passage for guests is to have them define edge. I'm interested in, in your <laughs> definition. Uh, my definition of edge is essentially anywhere you don't have multiple racks in a condi environmentally conditioned building or structure dedicated to housing those racks. Okay, okay. so modul modular data center, that's a data center, you know, by definition. Uh, you know, a, a couple of racks in a closet in a high-rise office building, you know, that's a data center. Uh, having, having a half rack on a factory floor, that's not a data center, that's edge. 
okay. having having a server or a dedicated IoT gateway on a farm, that's edge. Is it is it the lack of of IT infrastructure around it? What's what's making you sort of classify it like that? I I believe it is a physical infrastructure okay. challenge. Everything's internet connected now, so I don't want to point to you know you have to have this much bandwidth or or you know type of you know it has to have, be wired fiber optic bandwidth of a certain type, right? Uh, I think data center is is a an environmentally conditioned statement. So I might have data center in a box, but if it's in if it's in a you know if it's in a building that's not dedicated to housing computers, it's edge. Okay, well, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So then, from that perspective, if I have to roll out you know a fix for the the meltdown bug to this environmentally controlled data center or this non environmentally controlled data center, I don't have a person, right? I don't have well, a backup. I, um, I think that one one of the central you know, corollaries is that in, in my view of edge, IT has to roll a truck. There's, there's not someone on site 24 seven to go address what happens with that server or, or that node. If it's, it could be, could be, like I said, an internet gateway or a, a media server somewhere. Right. Okay. So it, you have to, you have to actually visit the location if you're going to do physical maintenance. And that means to do logical updates, it has to be over the wire. There's, there's nobody walking down an aisle checking on things. And I like, I like that, that definition. It's very functional for, right? If, if you're doing remote administration, it's an edge site. I mean, it's yeah. sort of a simple. There's, there's um, some gray overlap, but nothing in life is ever that clean. So <laughs> we use that. Especially not edge. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, when we look at edge, you're, you're, you know, I, I'd love to pin you sort of on hardware issues. I know you, you, you talk much more generally, but is there a specific hardware component to edge that you see where people should factor in, oh, this is edge hardware, or these are concerns from a, a buying, buying infrastructure for edge that's different than, you know, regular hardware infrastructure, regular IT infrastructure? The only substantial impact that we see is environmental concerns. If you're on an offshore oil platform, if you're on a cruise ship, if you're you know, on a farm, right. say, say a small, small farm out in West Texas versus you know, on the Carolina coast, there are different environmentals. And so for me, edge really is, is a, it is a physical locality. And so there's no magic about what chips you select or, or any, any of the electronics that go into it. It's how do, you, how do you get power to it? How do you dissipate the heat? And how do you get signals in and out? And so that's, that, that, those are custom by edge application. So you don't, you don't think that edge is going to create an opening for ARM to finally be a platform of choice from that perspective? You know, if you're talking about I mean, an office building, branch office, okay. the answer is, you know, in, until we got this Spectre meltdown thing, I'd said the chances were really slim, <laughs> okay? okay. Um, because x86 is the pre preferred architecture for enterprise. And so that's where AMD had planned on, you know, making its money with Epic. Um, as the as the x86 alternative high performance and and all of that um but i think right now the environment is if you're if you're going to update all of your environment over the next few years as soon as the specter and and meltdown proof processors appear on the market you're going to consider how you're going to update your infrastructure over a, a comparatively short amount of time, three, four years, maybe. Um, and, and completely churning your infrastructure in that amount of time is going to mean you want multiple suppliers. And if you're on a modern code base, then a whole x86 versus ARM thing is much less important than it used to be, which benefits ARM. So uh, there's two pieces to that. One is, are, are you saying that edge is more heterogeneous or will be heterogeneous? From absolutely. A, absolutely. Okay. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about, you know, 
running runtimes or interpretive just in, in time compiled or interpretive languages, they don't actually care about the underlying infrastructure very much. What, right. what you're doing is you're buying performance in a power envelope that you can environmentally condition depending on where you are. If you're in a sealed box in the middle of a, a field of grape vines, that's, that's a completely different environment than a telecom base station. And, and you're, you're going to, you're buying, you're buying patterns have to be different. But, but hold on a second though, because this is where I think things get a little funny to me is that if I'm in a telecom base station, you know, I, five years ago, my assumption would be that would be amazingly homogeneous, right? I'd have a hundred thousand and with 5g millions of these base stations with a, a vendor or maintainer's desire to have them as, you know, completely monotonous as possible with one vendor, one chipset, right? You know, who cares if it's out of date? I, I'm not changing it. it you know, and we haven't even talked about, you know, um, multi-tenant edge data centers. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm taking that for granted. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm, I'm just taking that for granted that we're going to have multiple, that we're, it's going to be cloud, cloudish, um, you know, where you have multiple, multiple vendors sharing infrastructure inside of these edges. Um, so if we talk about virtualized yeah. network functions, okay. we're, we're talking about modern infrastructure. Uh, we're talking about, a, you know, we're 64-bit processors everywhere, but we're, we're talking about a multi-core, fairly capable, you know, above two gigahertz per core processor that we can assign apps to uh, almost at random, right? But potentially at random. NFV, we want to be able to run, uh, say, analytics in, in the core data center and all the way out to the edge. Perhaps the only mm -hmm. difference being, you know, the volume of analytics that we can run. But there again, we, we scale in that the cloud has all the data and the edge is, has edge generated data. And so we don't need the same class of analytics out of the edge as we need in, in the core cloud. So I think it all scales very nicely. And so, it, so it you're, is, go ahead. You're, you're saying something that, that it, we hear across multiple podcasts um, and is worth pointing out which is that there will be a degree of portability, a high degree of portability between cloud infrastructures or traditional, you know, what, what I wouldn't say traditional, but, but modern app dev cloud type pipelines and deployment technologies and analytics. And then that needs to be very seamless back down into these edge infrastructures. That's a key design element. It sounds like. Yes, it does. And to your point about, you know, buying a fixed set of hardware uh, across many years, across, you know, perhaps a national or continental um, telephone system, the, I think it's less important to have homogeneous hardware than it is to have a homogeneous software infrastructure that can run on a variety of hardware. And I think even the telcos are starting to realize that, you know, purchasing over a span of five years in the processor market, you end up with radically different capabilities at the end of the, at the end of five years, even, even with the impending death of Moore's law, architecture is changing dramatically. And over the next five years, we're going to get non-volatile main memory. We're going to get all this new storage hierarchy because of that. And these architectures are going to have to react to it over time. You can't just say, I am going to buy, you know, this SKU that's available now for the next 10 years that that doesn't work. And the telcos know it. And so the idea that you're going to get your management infrastructure from your hardware vendor seems like a dead on arrival concept from that perspective. I think so. I think that the OEMs are hanging on to proprietary management as a way to hook their, you know, traditional core enterprise customers. I think that only works for so long. I, I honestly, I think most of them are, are going to have to go to, you know, least common denominator, redfish style management um, fairly quickly because as, as enterprise becomes private cloud, they're going to want the same kind of, heterogeneous hardware purchase patterns that the big cloud buys. Okay. They, they're, they're buying a lot of Intel. Now they want to buy AMD. They want to buy Qualcomm. They want to buy Cavium. Uh, they want to buy IBM power. 
And, and so as we see a richer mix here, it, the software infrastructure becomes important. The management across all of those diverse chassis and processor architectures becomes hugely important. And, and that's just, it, it means that nobody's going to end up using all the bells and whistles that have been designed for an on-site IT department to integrate into, into their business. Right. And even something like Redfish, which provides some, some commonality, has variants on a per vendor, per machine basis also. Because- right. And that kind of balkanization typically doesn't last very long. It, okay. either, it either destroys that you know, erstwhile standard or, or it promotes a stronger core standard that then becomes the least common denominator. Yeah, I, I guess our our experience with this is that the least common denominators end up, you know, it does you you end up with the least common denominator. But there's reasons for the balkanization, um, and from our perspective, you end up embracing embracing it because there's things you need when you need them, um, and you you don't care most of the time, right? The, the least right. common denominator: reboot, reset, turn on, change your next boot, end up being standard because they're driven by external needs. Right. Yep. Um, and then the, the things that where a vendor's enabled some cool feature, there's no way you're going to make that part of least common denominator. You just have to accommodate it when you find it. Um, so, and one of the places where I, I feel like there's still a tremendous amount of churn is in the graphics, the GPU pieces. Um, and you and I, before before the we started push the record button, and we're talking a little bit about GPUs on the edge, um, and the the need for GPU on the edge. Um, and I'm gonna I'll, I'll I'll highlight as reading as as uh, outside reading material the Nvidia Tesla not Tesla Nvidia uh, Uber announcements. Um, where so, where you, yeah, go ahead. I'll just say yeah the. And a vehicle is a very large edge device, self-powered, <laughs> by the way, right? It's got its own generator in it. Um, and so let's back up for a second and ask about the, the challenge. The challenge is we want to do better analytics at the edge. And we want artificial intelligence at the edge. I think most people, when you peel the onion back on that, um, want deep learning at the edge. Okay, they want some form of convolutional neural network or potentially some of these new spiking neural networks because they want a device that's going to react to local conditions, learn from local conditions a little bit better, customize itself to the environment. And th- that, that need is spurring bringing GPUs and other forms of uh, neural network accelerators down into the edge. As we look at that, um, say we're, <laughs> there's so many different aspects to this architectural storm that we're in. Yeah, this whole explosion of, of deep neural net techniques. Part of the reason GPUs are so good at it is they're really good at matrix math. Right. And, and I'll back up to a special case in just a minute on that. But they're very good at matrix math. Matrix math is the core of the convolutional neural network that we've been using for the past five years. There aren't really any standards yet in how to create these models, how to use the models. There's a proliferation of modeling languages. You've heard of some of them, you know, TensorFlow, um, Theano, Cafe, you know, they're, they're, they're all over the map. Um, in fact, each of the cloud giants has its own language. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, Microsoft's got CNTK. Um, yeah, Baidu's got Paddle. It's so th- each of them looks at neural network as a as a form of competitive advantage, and because this is all such a moving target algorithmically, you want a general purpose solution to accelerate it for the time being, right? And that's where we are with GPUs. Is the GPU from the game world from high performance computing? Turns out it's pretty good at doing matrix math. Yeah. Um, where it stumbles a little bit is doing sparse matrices because it has to actually load all the zeros into the matrix and multiply that out. Okay. And, and so that's where we're seeing a lot of activity and kind of semi-custom and custom neural network accelerators. So you hear about wave computing and uh, Grok, um, graph core, 
companies like that uh, are working on, I wouldn't say dedicated accelerators. They're working on general purpose, deep neural network accelerators that can do sparse math more efficiently, sparse memory accesses more, you know, scatter is, gather more efficiently. Is this hardware or does, is this software from that perspective or it's, is it a combination? It's a combination, uh, okay. but it, it's, it's hardware that is potentially more efficient than, uh, than the GPU. And, and even the okay. GPU is a moving target, right? Volta, NVIDIA's Volta architecture, you know, has all the traditional um, GPU pipelines in it. It also has what, what NVIDIA calls a tensor core, which is a, you know, almost a, a tensor processing unit, Google's terminology, TPU. It's, it's a, it is a matrix math engine designed to do convolutional neural networks Im embedded in each of the GPU SIMDs. And so when you're using that, you're actually not using some of the classical GPU pipeline. And, and so we're, this is all moving architecture target. So, the, wow, what you're describing to me, so I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm thinking through data center design and edge infrastructure design and things like that. And what you're saying is things are moving so fast that, you know, I'm deploying, you know, 10,000 data centers for edge. I better be prepared that I'm going to be shipping you know, new units out to those edges, plugging them in and expecting to integrate them in on an ongoing basis. I can't wait to start deploying <laughs> the infrastructure, but I also can't get it right. So, right? Does that... and that's where chassis flexibility comes in. So, you know, PCI Express 4.0 coming up, um, you'll want to, you'll want to implement that for a lot of these add-in cards. Um, IBM has been working with their open power community on uh, CAPI 2.0, which leverages some of the NVIDIA and VLink work. And so the, the, the thought is buy a flexible chassis that you can add these outboard accelerators to, right, um, outside of the processor. And, and it's a combination of classical x86 ARM power, you know, processors uh, running with this very specific acceleration to do uh, artificial intelligence techniques. And, and it, all you can plan on is being flexible there because the solutions in three years are going to be much different than what we have today. Right. But, but so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, a, a big retail chain. I want to do video on, you know, video processing and sentiment analysis of my shoppers so I, I send out a, you know, an edge data center to the store or the mall gives me access to an edge data center uh, as a resource, which sounds like a, you know, to me a, a promising model because right. you don't want to, every store doesn't want to maintain this. They want to, they want to share the resource. Um, and now, and now we're saying, okay, so I just deployed that. And then I've got to take 20% of that infrastructure and be constantly, be re, you know, constantly refreshing it, sending it back. Here's a new one with new capability. Heterogeneity in those data centers is going to be high. Well, I'd say, of, yeah. So I'd say the updates aren't going to be that frequent. If it, if a solution works for a customer, it works for a customer, right? If you if you buy that solution to do automatic face detection of crowds. And, and sentiment analysis on those faces and, and you implement it and it, it actually works. The reasons you would upgrade it are that uh, perhaps you want to do more faces per frame. Uh, you want to do it more real time. You're, you're not capturing folks who walk into a store, spend 20 seconds looking around and leave. You want to, during that 20 seconds, you want to, you want to notice that that shopper is, uh, is not engaged and send a salesperson over to, to greet them. So you do it every once in a while to get a, a, a measurable incremental step in capability. But I don't think there's any kind of like sideways refinement here, no continual refinement. Somebody's gonna give you a much better algorithm that you need to run on different hardware. And that's your cause to upgrade, but that'll happen every three or four years. The, the, so if you're running a cloud data center, maybe different. Um, well, this is this is where the the multi tenant the multi tenancy becomes an interesting question, where right. uh, if you're dealing with multi you know servicing if you're the mall and not the retailer, then you're 
it becomes a competitive, you know, one, you're going to do it because you want better utilization of your infrastructure. And two, you're actually trying to offer uh, this competitive advantage uh, so that they use, they use you. It's um, right. And, and it, at, over the next few years, we're going to see a lower power cost per transaction, watts per mm -hmm. watts per inference, right? Watts per insight. We still haven't figured out really how to, you know, what the metrics are behind that, but you know that your power bill hasn't gone up, but your capability has gone up dramatically. You, you, right? You've just, you've just uh, thrown in a Jevons paradox uh, expectation that, uh, for me, which is if, if we can drive the cost of these transactions down, then we're going to see a massive spike in, in the use of the, of the use of the technologies. I, I think that does happen. Um, it, it, competitively, if a shopping center can capture more of the traffic going through it, and we know they have to because people are shopping more and more online, um, physical stores have to get more efficient at capturing the people who walk into the store and, and kind of making it hard for them to leave a store without buying something they need or want. Okay, that want is you know, different than need. But if you can if you can convert somebody who came in for a specific item, decided it was too expensive or didn't see it on the shelf, and and give them something else to walk out of the store with, that's that's a that's a huge win. Um, that's a big win. Yep. Right. And so that's that's a, the retail example. Um, you know, running offshore platforms or or you know large IoT infrastructure with minimum human staff uh, reduces expenses. All of that. Um, so there there are some pretty big use cases for becoming much more efficient cruise ships. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. One of Microsoft's examples for uh, Azure Stack is a, you know, a intermittently connected data center. So the ship leaves port satellite link is too slow for the amount of business they're doing on the ship. And so they've got thousands of people where they're handling, you know, tens of thousands of transactions per day and tracking people through the ship, making sure they're having fun, that they're offered things they want to do, uh, that they don't miss the things that they've signed up for. And yeah, you know, it, it, so again, more efficient use of people's time and the infrastructure makes for a happier experience. People want to go back on the cruise again. Right. This, this is where augmented reality and, and things like that can, you know, transform those experiences into something that's, that's much richer and requires a lot of low, very low latency, uh, you know, AI type uh, activity to, to provide the, the experience. Right? So augmented reality is, stretches, stresses everything. It, it's, it is the business case that wraps all of the technology that we've been talking about into one uh, high value bundle. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're, you know, it's going to be decades before we get that sorted out to where it's, it's a natural thing that people are able to do with glasses or contact lenses and earbuds and in an intuitive fashion. But yeah, the Holy grail is that, um, that I have kind of my own personal Jarvis that yes. tells me when I'm missing something I need to know about an emergency, a sale coupon, you know, uh, notices my blood sugar is low, says, hey, there's a store, you know, restaurant across the way you should go check out, been rated very highly. Um, but generally just helps us improve our life. Um, and along the way, it helps vendors uh, conduct business with us in a more friction-free fashion. Um, that That is absolutely going to happen. And um, I think it is it is a bundle of not just the display and, and audio environments and the hands free and the mobile aspect of it, but providing that timely ex advice, as you said, is an AI based activity, right? right. Some things are going to ping back to the cloud, where where it can make a, a insightful and and deep kind of thoughtful recommendation to you, as a friend would, yeah, you know, walking down the street, hey. Yeah, we should go over there. You like doing that. Right. Oh, those, I, it's, it's exciting where things are going. I, I think when, as IT professionals, and we look at what the infrastructure requirement is behind that, um, 
you know, it's, it's exciting if you like change. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'll say, it's, you know, as we, as we talk about all of the technologies, so we've got, you know, processor update coming, we've got new memory and storage stuff coming out. Um, we haven't talked about the 5G rollout, which right. is going to happen kind of in the 2021, 20, 22 on through the rest of the 2020s timeframe. Five, five, 5G is the next uh, cell tower, uh, cell phone uh, innovation, but it's much shorter range. So a lot more, a lot more stations. Actually, it's latency. variable, variable range, variable bit rate. Okay. And so 5G solves some of the problems with 4G in terms of, uh, as I wander farther away from the base station, it can actually negotiate lower data rates at high quality. Okay. okay. So I can make those trade-offs between quality and data rate and cost of plan uh, I can I can have very long distance connections at very low bit rate. Um, so uh, five five G is is a set of new radio technologies, um, you know, based on you know smaller phased array antennas and all this all this new modem technology. And it will, it, you know, I, I love watching the demos of augmented reality walking through a you know city core, and it's like our network can't support that. You know, the usability and graphics, we can figure out all those, you know, how to use each individual device. But the connectedness of these augmented reality demonstrations need, screams for 5G and we're going to get it. Um, and so everything is going to transform over the next 10 years. Uh, we're we're going to see huge differences in how people use technology, how it's deployed, how it's managed um, at scale across you know, body area networks, you know, city area networks. It's just, in some respects, the network topology becomes fractal to a, a much higher degree. Okay, so I, I, I would normally conclude there, but I have one question that I've been itching to ask on top of all this, on top of all this awesome future <laughs> thinking and, and, and edge. Um, Cause you and I talk about this sometimes and, and I, I know people love hyper-converged infrastructure. Um, I don't, I don't entirely get it. What's, what's your take on, cause, and the, there's an edge, there's an edge and there's a data center, right? So this is, you know, can you define hyper-converged and then what, what gets people so excited about, about hyper-converged, especially when they start talking about edge or they start talking about enterprise data center? So to me, I'm going to go back in time just a little bit. Um, it, it, it's hard to do this without a little bit of history. You know, back you know, as recently as the early 2000s, uh, bef before hypervisors were and virtualization was widely deployed, you bought and configured a, a server to run a, a single app. And you configured that server to run your worst case for that app. And so there was, a, you know, before we got virtualization, there were a lot of, of app servers out there that had been bought and configured for use that they'll never see. Over-provisioned is yeah. a good word, right? And so, you know, you fast forward a couple of decades and we buy virtualized infrastructure now in these hyper-converged, over-provisioned bundles. It's easy to it's easy to buy them that way. Where where instead of managing for a single app's worst case, what we're doing is we're we're managing we're buying our infrastructure to run worst case worst case app instances. Okay, so we want a beefy hyperconverged box because we know our worst case app looks like this, and we want that worst case app to run on any server in that rack. Okay. Okay, and so there is a degree of over-provisioning to hyper-converged, but there's a simplicity in purchasing, okay, where, you know, enterprises that are running leaner IT shops don't have to make such a, you know, they, they don't have to go in and configure the nth degree on, on this rack of servers because it's going to be running this specific rack of, or, or class of applications. We haven't had the management frameworks to do that yet. Okay. Okay. So hyperconverged is an app portability statement, which says we want any of these servers to run 
our worst case app instance. So they have to be equal and they have to be at this high level of provisioning. The cloud vendors do a little bit of that app sloshing themselves. They have app classes, yeah. um, but they're better able to target specific use cases because they can, they can afford to buy, you know, a couple rows of a specific SKU, a, a specific configuration to serve a very narrow application class. Uh, and so I, as, as infrastructure management gets better and more granular, and as our ability to decide to run an app instance on a hardware instance that's appropriate to that app becomes more fluid, I think we'll see less dependence on hyper-converged. Fair enough. I like, I like your defining it as a, as an over, as a sort of a hardware's cheap over provision. I'm going to buy a, a rack of gear, virtualize it, and then uh, uh, spend less time managing it. Absolutely. Uh, Paul, is it, hold on. Is it that much cheaper? I always thought it was a lot more expensive than just like a white. Box. Oh, hardware in general is cheap compared to the management cost is what okay. I'm saying. Not, yes. no, HCI yes. is premium, premium gear, and then you need premium software on top of it. It is not. It's not cheap. Paul's gonna, it's unless not Paul's going to say, Rob, you're wrong. It, it's, <laughs> it's the most expensive way to go. Okay. I, it is, but, it, but it, in terms of people power and, and IT brain power to make it happen, uh, it's, it's easy to purchase. The, the OEMs have made hyper-converged, uh, you know, kind of easy to configure, easy to purchase, easy to deploy. And, and so in that sense, you're, you're, you are buying something by being a bit over-provisioned. Over uh, my, my statement about the next five to 10 years is, you know, with AI techniques, we're going to get much better at actually putting, putting an instance where it needs to run. And so we're not going to need to provision all of our, inst all of our hardware instances to run that worst case software image. Um, that will get a lot better. And it means that we don't have to buy everything at the same level of config. I knew I was going to open up a whole new line of questions and I, and we're also at, <laughs> at, at our time limit on, uh, I'll have to save my PCI questions for another day. And, and Paul, I just I'm want afraid. to say specter is spelled differently. My last name. So you didn't crash <laughs> me the last 40 minutes. So I'm okay. <laughs> okay. It's not it's not Stephen's fault that we have a hardware issue. It's dating. spelled <laughs> differently. I, I blame me for that. I do have to run to my next. Um, so I've had a very <laughs> enjoyable conversation. Thanks very much. Do you want to tell us how to get in touch with you or get more information you? Oh, before you? Absolutely. Um, you can check us out at www.tiriasresearch. T i t i r i a s research dot com. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks again, everyone. And uh, we'll, we'll talk again soon for sure, Paul. Sounds great. Take thanks, care. Bye-bye.